right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to, again, it's still the first day, but uh, uh, to an exciting in-person conference and to a session that we put together, uh, thinking on, once again on, on, on you all. Uh, this section is the Rustock selection as a tool to address soil challenges and major, major pests and diseases. Uh, we have an active Rustock research portfolio at ABC. Uh, that portfolio, uh, it's funded by, with, the money, with, with your support, and it provides support to the researchers, uh, many of the researchers that you see here on the stage that are going to be sharing with you the latest results of this research portfolio, where we have the development component, the pre-field screening, and the field evaluation, and, and, and it, I really like the output of this portfolio that produced this third-party data collection of how different rootstocks perform and can help you to overcome biotic or abiotic stress such as pests, diseases, or salt, boron, tolerant, etc. You will hear today from uh, uh, farm advisor Roger Duncan. He is not an exchange for you in this area. He has been working many years uh, near in, in the Modesto area uh, evaluating different rootstocks. Then we're going to hear from Catherine Jarvis. She, uh, she is also a farm advisor from um, uh, the north part, from the Sacramento north part. She has a very interesting uh, ev evaluation rootstock project in Borum. And then Andreas Westfall is going to be sharing his results uh, all the way from, Ke uh, from Kearney Center in nematodes. He, uh, he has looked into nematodes for a while. And ultimately, we asked Chuck Fleck from Sierra Gold to give us a little bit of his perspective from an industry view uh, about rootstocks. So with that said, please uh, help me to welcome all the speakers that we have here. And I really look forward for a wonderful uh, session. Thank you. This is little, yeah. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Roger Duncan, the farm advisor in Stanislaw County, and I get to kick off our, our panel here. And uh, our goal, I think, is to convince all of you that rootstock is an extremely important thing uh, to consider when you're getting your trees. So rootstocks obviously influence, thank you, a lot of, uh, a lot of things. Uh, nematodes we'll hear about, and, and soil-borne diseases. Some are very tolerant to uh, chloride and sodium and, and, uh, and alkaline soil and these sorts of things. But, but even beyond the biotic and abiotic changes, uh, challenges, uh, rootstocks influence a lot of things. So vigor and, and uh, data maturity, drought tolerance, anchorage, all these sorts of things. So what is the best rootstock? This is a very common question. And unfortunately, the answer is it kind of it depends, one of those sorts of things. Because the rootstock that will be best in your orchard is not necessarily the best rootstock uh, for somebody else. And so you really need to understand your site. And then you can choose the best rootstock based on the challenges that you expect from that orchard. So um, there are probably 20 at least rootstocks out there available now if you look at all the different catalogs uh, that the nurseries put out. But really for almonds, it really there are three buckets of genes that go into these um, almond rootstocks. So essentially almond, peach, and, and plum. And so uh, the, if we just kind of maybe think about that, maybe it's easier than remembering what all of these rootstocks do. But almond is uh, native to very dry area, very little rainfall, and as a result, it is very drought tolerant, but on the downside, it's susceptible to wet feet. Um, it also tends to do very, uh, or, or have uh, more resistance to salts, uh, alkaline soil conditions. Uh, it's very vigorous and has uh, deep roots. Um, and uh, so peach would be the, the next bucket of genes that we utilize, and here are some, here are a list of some peach rootstocks and I'm sure you would you recognize at least Lovell and Nemegard from that list. Um, peach uh, is native to uh, a wetter area, so it would be uh, 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 so higher rainfall areas of China, which would be sort of similar to maybe our southwest, or I'm sorry, southeast of the United States. So more summer rain. It's not as drought tolerant, uh, not as tolerant to salts and high pH soil and that sort of a thing. Um, and then the third bucket is plum. Now, plum is, is a little bit tricky to use with almond because there are some incompatibility issues sometimes. Uh, but the plum genes are brought in because plum, in general, now these are very broad statements, in general, plum tends to be more disease tolerant and more tolerant of wet soils. 
And so now there are a lot of crosses that, that uh, use uh, peaches, plums, almonds. Um, so a lot of peach almond hybrids are now available. You can see the list here, Hanson, Brights, BB-106, Cornerstone, a couple of Titans, um, and then uh, Crimsk 86, which is now uh, much more common. It's a peach and plum cross, Root Pack R, which is Almond and Plus, and then Viking and Atlas, which is a complex hybrid of peach plum. Um, and this one actually has apricot in it. So now uh, I'll talk about soil tolerance and vigor. That, those are my two assignments. So if we look at the salinity tolerance of rootstocks, so remember I talked about how almond itself is very salt tolerant, um, peach is not. So if you, for most of these rootstocks uh, that have almond in it, they tend to be um, much more salt tolerant. So here's an old rootstock trial that was planted in the 80s in Merced County, and just comparing Nema Garden Lovell to two peach almond hybrids of Hansen and Bright's, uh, Bright's hybrid. At that time it was not a Seed, or it was not a clone, it was a seedling. Um, but you can just see how the Nimagard and Lovell trees were uh, taking up and, and, and ex exporting about three times as much sodium and chloride to the leaves. So to the point where we're way above the, the critical level and you can see the toxic signs of leaf burn uh, that were occurring in Nimagard and Lovell. A different rootstock trial, and this is in uh, Stanislaw County in uh, sandy loam soil. And so these are kind of color coded. So the top, uh, so these are sort of, uh, these are the peach rootstocks up here. And then the next three rows are peach almond rootstocks, peach almond hybrids. And again, just look at the amount of sodium and the chloride that is accumulating in these peach rootstocks. And then look at the difference if you look at a peach almond hybrid. Um, just tremendous, uh, you know, much, much more tolerant or accumulate much less sodium and chloride in the leaves. Um, Viking and Atlas. So these two are, are pretty similar genetically, but they are not the same. And I think that Atlas, um, I hear people talk about Atlas being salt tolerant. It really is not all that salt tolerant. Viking is much more salt tolerant than Atlas. Um, so if you're really looking for a salt tolerant rootstock, Atlas is probably not the best choice. Um, you would, you know, these, some of these others, Viking would certainly be a better choice. Krimsk 86, which has become much more popular, is also not salt tolerant. Um, a third trial, this is looking at just chloride. This is on the west side of, the, of Stanislaw County, of the San Joaquin Valley, where chloride is a big problem. Again, um, Crimsk 86, so th this, this starts at the top and goes in descending order. So these at the top are, are the ones that have a lot of chloride. Uh, Crimsk 86 at the top of the list showing a lot of, um, of these sorts of leaf burn symptoms. Then the next four are peach. And then, you know, if you want to get down to where the, uh, the, the real salt tolerant rootstocks are, they're down here at the, at the bottom. And these bottom five, or five out of the bottom six, are peach almond hybrid rootstocks. And then root pack R, which is half almond and half plum. So again, that almond um, genetics really helps with that uh, salt accumulation. So vigor and yield. All right, so uh, rootstock has a lot of influence on vigor, and again, these are sort of color-coded, so the top, these are the, the smallest rootstocks. We're looking at um, uh, trunk circumference here, trunk circumference, so the longer bars are the, are the more vigorous ones, and again, if you look down at the bottom, the most vigorous rootstocks are these brown ones, which are peach almond hybrids. Um, there is this, this is a peach, this, pe this Empyrean one, you know, there's always a joker in the crowd that, that, that uh, doesn't follow the rules. So this peach rootstock, Empyrean 1, behaves a lot more like a peach almond hybrid than a, than a, a peach. But in general, the tree size falls in line. The peach almond hybrids are the largest. The plum rootstocks are the smallest. And the peach uh, is kind of intermediate. And then have the effect on yield. So there are a lot of numbers here, I know, um, but just you just, so again, these are ranked in terms of trunk circumference. The largest trees tend to be these brownish rows, which are peach almond hybrids. Again, here's Empyrean one up here that's um, uh, also a very large tree. And uh, so this is trunk circumference, and this is um, what we call PAR, or photosynthetically active radiation. Um, which is a measure of canopy size. So larger par equals larger canopy. Um, and larger canopies almost always mean larger yield. So here's a, a 2020 yield, 
and the cumulative yield and the highest yielding rootstocks tend to be the larger peach almond hybrid rootstocks. Um, but if you want to look at yield efficiency, you know, as it turns out, these peach almond hybrid rootstocks actually appear to be more uh, yield efficient as well. So we're getting uh, not just more yield because the rootstock, the trees are bigger, but they appear to be more yield efficient. So we're getting more yield per canopy size. It's not, it, it isn't, um, that doesn't work in every trial, but it, it, it works in most trials. Why is this not going? There we go. Okay, here we go. So there, so those, the, the, the most efficient, or the ones that have the most yield per canopy tend to be the larger peach almond hybrid rootstocks. So that was my trial. Uh, I'm gonna have to skip to the next. This, this is the same, this is a, a trial that Catherine has in Yolo County. And um, again, uh, uh, the highest yielding rootstocks tend to be the peach almond hybrids. And when you look at the size efficiency, this is the number of pounds per percent of sunlight intercepted. Again, the, most, uh, the highest yielding per canopy are the, the more vigorous peach almond hybrid rootstocks. And then lastly, going back and looking at some old rootstock trial, this is John Edstrom's trial at Nichols, and very similar um, unit per par, uh, 2009, 2010, the most yield efficient were the Brights, Nichols, and Hansen, which are peach almond hybrids. Um, and then in the 2010, um, Atlas kind of joined the party and, was, and, and looked pretty good there as well. Okay, so in conclusion, rootstock characteristics tend to fall in behind their almond, peach, or plum parents, at least in terms of the, the things that I talked about. Uh, peach almond hybrid rootstocks are among the most tolerant to sort of crummy alkaline soil conditions and salt. Um, they also tend to be more vigorous and tend to yield more and have higher yield efficiency. However, they do not grow well in all conditions. And so getting back to the very beginning, you have to choose a rootstock that is best uh, for your soil and, and you don't want to end up with uh, any big disasters. So with that, I will hand the baton over. Thanks, Roger. All right. So, so Roger's touched on the basics of rootstocks and why we care about them and sort of how you want to go about evaluating what you choose, that you really need to think about what the limiting factor of your site is and do the homework of your site first. And talked about salts and yield efficiency and canopy size, how rootstocks affect all of those. I'm going to talk about uh, boron, which is somewhat related to salts, but not quite the same thing, and anchorage. So with funding from the Almond Board, um, I have a trial in Yolo County, which is one of the hot spots we have for boron as you go up and down the west side of the Central Valley, where we are looking at different rootstocks under high boron conditions. So boron is a problem, can be toxic with too much of it in all our plant systems, but if you come from other cropping systems, you might think of boron as showing up like salt burn on the edge of the leaf. Um, it's a problem and looks different in almonds because it actually piggybacks on top of the sugars as they keep recirculating in the tree. And one of the effects of that is that it actually makes a sort of gummy um, coagulation in the sugar pipes of the tree. And then that pressure from that backlog bursts at the weakest points of the pipes, which is usually where things branch out. Um, so you get that gumming in the crotch and in the branching points, um, which is a wet, sugary wound that fungus then also loves to come take advantage of that's right at the heart of the tree. Um, so yeah, so you can see on the left is, is more example of, or same example of that gumming, but then on your right, that was gumming and a wound that started in the crotch, and you can see how that infection, a uh, following fungal infection, worked its way up that scaffold and is killing that scaffold. So we don't like that. Right? Uh, <coughs> that's bad. Um, another thing, because it piggybacks on the sugars, it goes to the growing points. So if you are farming in a high boron situation, this is why you get a lot of mummy nuts or stuck stick tight nuts. Uh, because it goes to the growing nuts, that's a sink for the sugar, and so it becomes an attractant for the boron as well. And it also goes to the growing tips of the shoots. That's why we end up with a lot of these spindly dead shoots 
in high boron situations if we pick the wrong rootstock. Um, but rootstocks can really come to the rescue here in these high boron situations and act sort of like a bouncer to keep the boron from getting up into the scion. So this is the same exact site. This is our rootstock trial. And you see on your left is Lovell, which you can tell is doing pretty poorly with this high boron situation. And on your right is one of the peach almond hybrids. So at this trial, we found, an, and as Roger said, a lot of this sort of follows categories of rootstocks. Um, so the green lines are all peach almond hybrids at this trial that we've been doing since 2011. Um, the purple is Viking, so that complex hybrid that has some almond, also peach, plum, and nectarine, or excuse me, peach, plum, apricot. Um, the blue is, we should have gotten our color coding <laughs> light up, sorry guys. The blue is root pack R and crimps 86, and the red is level red because stay away. Um, but so, so that was yield. <coughs> Um, but I wanted to touch back to what Roger was talking about is this idea of yield efficiency, right? So, so this is pure yield, but when we look at yield efficiency, we're looking at yield on a per unit canopy basis. So it's a way to divide yield by the size of the canopy and see, okay, for your canopy class, essentially, who's punching above their weight? And when we do that, we see that that purple line, which shows Viking, um, is actually punching above its weight for its size um, and playing more in the realm of the peach almond hybrids. So if you are in a situation where for other reasons Viking makes more sense for you than a peach almond hybrid, you can put them in at a tighter spacing, maybe get some of that Viking advantage without losing the advantage that you would otherwise get from a vigorous peach almond hybrid. Okay, so if you wanna hear these jokes again, you can watch this YouTube video <coughs> um, that the almond board uh, came out and we, we did essentially a guided tour of this site because you know, you're know you seeing three or four photos here, but that doesn't really capture, if you're making a big investment into these orchards, what you're gonna be looking at. Um, so we go through each of the nine different rootstocks we have at the site and talk them through and show you video of the, these full grown trees. So if you just uh, go into YouTube and look for almond boron rootstock, hopefully you should find this. And kudos to the almond board for helping do that video or doing it together. Okay, my next uh, assignment was to talk about Anchorage before we handed this off to Andreas um, as one of the key aspects of rootstock selection. Um, so this is work that Astrid Boulder at UC Davis has done, and she has these great tools um, to air spade out the dirt around roots. And, um, and just to sort of illustrate that different roots can have very different root structures, and you can imagine you get different anchorage with whether you're growing the tree on the left or the right. These are actually the same genetics, but one uh, was treated very differently. The canopy was treated very differently and more stressed. So I, I think that there's sort of there's two aspects to anchorage. You have your sort of chronic anchorage problems with leaning, um, and these are data from one of Rogers' trials where they went out and just said, you know, even if even if these trees aren't stressed by big gusts of wind how well are they holding up uh, when just the weight of a large tree is on top of them? Um, and I would say that too, that if you have a high number, that means you're leaning a lot. Um, and what Roger did was broke down the percent of trees that are, had over a 15 degree lean. So that's about a 15 degree lean shown in that picture there. And Crimps 86 and Viking did very well, did not have a lot of trees in those heavy leaning conditions. Um, those are the ones that jump out at me. So if you're in a high wind uh, situation, especially this could be important to you. Um, if you're really paying attention, you'll notice those are not almond trees, but it's one of the most breathtaking examples I have of a, a big gust uh, blowing over in a block that was half Crimps 86 and half M40. This is a plum orchard. And you can just see the hurt on a lot of those trees in the foreground. And if you drive to the middle of this orchard where Crimps 86 is on your left and uh, M40 is on your right, you can look into those rows on the right and see lots of trees that are leading over, whereas they were all just pinned straight in the Crimps 86. So it can make a big difference, the rootstock you choose if you're in a windy scenario. And earlier, um, 
research funded by the Amman board a while ago um, with Mario Viveros down south in Kern County also found this to be true. They had uh, in 2001 an insanely wet windstorm that came through with 80 mile per hour winds after um, two inches of rain over five hours and it was a great test for these different rootstocks. You can see Bright's five did all right, Hanson's did all right, Viking did very well, uh, Nemegard as a peach and Atlas as a complex hybrid did not do as well. So if you're in a situation where you might get heavy winds and heavy rain, especially the two of them together, where that saturated soil won't be holding the tree up as well, that's definitely something you wanna pay attention to. And Greg Brown goes here. Thank you, yeah, uh, Greg, a uh, researcher from USDA, he couldn't make it in person, but he sent a video. So if uh, back in the room you could switch to the video and we could hear what Greg has to tell us about Phytophthora and different rootstocks, uh, thank you. Should I press, should I press anything? No, you guys have it. with you due to my employer's uh, safety policies with COVID. I'm going to talk to you about rootstock selection and interactions with Phytophthora and replant diseases. All right, problem one is this Phytophthora crown and root rot. It has many contributing factors, but for this presentation, in this, in this uh, discussion, we're gonna focus only on rootstock. And I am not going to focus on a related problem uh, that we refer to as perennial phytophthora canker, which mostly results from cyan infections. I will talk about that in a different presentation tomorrow morning. Okay. The almond industry is, has got lots of things to pay attention to in this rapidly changing world, but I'd just like to offer some uh, thoughts on industry trends that would justify more attention to rootstocks for management of Phytophthora and replant diseases. First off, um, there's, there's been quite a shift from peach rootstocks to peach almond hybrid rootstocks, especially Hansen 536 in much of the San Joaquin Valley. And uh, this has led to some more troubles with Phytophthora than what we're used to, say, in the last couple decades. Um, there's been a continuing apparent infestation of some nursery stock, and this has given some growers some trouble. Uh, We've had continuing shifts in and movement of populations of Phytophthora. So the composition of the uh, Phytophthora uh, species we're up against has changed and, and they're getting around um, over time. Um, we've evolved into planting systems that require frequent localized irrigations with drip or micro sprinklers emitters, at least to get the orchard started. Um, we can get into suboptimal placement of drip systems or micro sprinkler emitters as orchards develop. Uh, high densities of orchards can, can complicate this a bit too. Um, and then with respect to replant disease, um, we've had increasing restrictions on soil fumigation that we've in the past used routinely to uh, get very good management of these diseases. Okay, uh, first focus will be on the Phytophthora. Um, what we really uh, noticed lately is that there's multiple and diverse causal species involved in the crown and root rot. Uh, the vast majority of these species affect roots and crown first. We do have some cyan infections, but of all these that you see in this image, uh, these many different species, Cinnamomy, Niederhauseri, Cactorum, Megasperma, and a new one called Mediterranea, used to be known as Phytophthora species AX. 
these all invade through the roots and crown of the trees. And so for this reason, rootstock is, is really a key factor. Um, first comment before we even get into discussing different rootstocks, um, one thing to think about as a grower is you got to give your rootstock a chance by planting it so that it protrudes up above the soil line. And in this way, it can serve as a barrier to cyan infection. You have to keep in mind that almond tissue, the cyan, is very highly susceptible to Phytophthora species, whereas the rootstock at least has some rootstock resist some resistance to Phytophthora, whatever it is, compared to almond. So you can uh, really reduce your your risk of infection um, by giving that rootstock, getting letting it stick its head up above ground slightly. And then the other big factor is um, the irrigation system management. That environment right around the root crown is, is very critical, as we'll discuss more. Okay, but what about genetic resistance of different rootstocks? Um, we have invested quite a bit of time in this question. Uh, first off, we did a lot of greenhouse evaluations of resistance to Phytophthora. Uh, you can see here some of our screening in the greenhouse and we assess disease resistance by how much and, and how severe root and crown rot develops in the selections we're testing. Um, from this work, um, we kind of confirmed that, well, Hansen 536 is relatively susceptible. You can see these are uh, severities of root rot in the top graph and uh, crown rot in the bottom graph. And you see that in both cases, uh, Hansen 536 stands out as being relatively susceptible compared to our peach root stocks, Lovell, Nemegard, and uh, some of the more complex hybrids, Atlas, Viking, and then this experimental citation, and then our resistant standard, Mariana 2624. Um, more recently, we have moved to field screening or orchard screening of resistance of rootstocks to Phytophthora. And uh, we're, uh, this just is a picture of our work going on at the Kearney Ag Center near Parlier. And uh, we feel that these assessments may be more reliable than the greenhouse assessments. And so we've moved that direction. Basically, the way we do this is uh, do exactly as we would advise you not to do in an orchard and uh, we expose the, the trees to Phytophthora and uh, soil water saturation. Uh, we have control plots. Resistance is assessed basically the way we do it in the greenhouse with incidence and severity of crown rot, as you see here. We monitor uh, infective activity of the inoculum with these uh, pear fruit baits periodically. Uh, what have we found out from that field screening? Uh, to date, uh, this shows some results with commercial standard rootstocks that are available to you now. And as you see, um, these are kind of arranged in type. The first two are our peach standards, Empyrean 1, which is also peach background, uh, next, and then several uh, peach almond and more complex hybrids, and then some of our plum hybrids. Um, a special interest here, um, you notice Hansen 536 is relatively susceptible, but even this peach type, Empyrean 1, is highly susceptible. Um, and then some of our other hybrids, uh, for example, the Titan hybrid, uh, SG1 and Viking, they have performed uh, relatively well among the peach almond hybrids and expressed less susceptibility to Phytophthora compared to Hansen 536. So this is our you know, first set of results with these stocks, but we'll be repeating to verify that. And then this is from the same experiment, but I've to these standard root stocks I just showed you results from, I've added a series of experimental root stocks that we're testing. This is a, a team aspect of the 
of the work in testing for resistance to agrobacterium, crown, cause of crown gall, and also a species of plant parasitic nematodes is being done. Uh, and our, our goal is to um, obtain rootstocks that have multiple pest resistances to these disease problems. Okay, the second problem that uh, I wanted to take up with you today um, with respect to rootstocks is what we refer to as prunus replant disease. It's a microbe induced growth suppression that we observe in prunus planted after prunus without uh, precautions taken such as shown in this image. This is from a field trial. You see these very uh, stunted trees in the foreground. These are planted after almond in uh, non, whoops, non-fumigated soil, stunting here, compared to this row in the background, which is planted in pre-plant fumigated soil. Um, this, this prunus replant disease, or PRD, is a problem that's distinct from nematode parasitism. Uh, it's not the same thing. It operates without the presence of nematodes. Of course, nematodes can add a dimension to the problem. There we go. Um, and it, this prunus replant disease is impacted by many factors, uh, but rootstock will be the focus here. Basically, um, how we investigated interaction of rootstocks with replant disease is planted a, a panel of rootstocks in control plots after prunus that were not pre-plant fumigated and also in a replicated design, the same panel of rootstocks in fumigated soil. And we looked at how much stunting occurred in the rootstock due to a lack of fumigation and used that to assess the general level of resistance or tolerance to the, to the disease problem. And uh, here is what we found from one of those experiments. These are a list of rootstocks across the bottom. And in this case, all of the peach rootstocks of peach parentage are coated yellow. The peach almond hybrids are coated green. And then the various plum hybrids are coated uh, blue or purple here. And what I've done here is calculated the um, growth that occurred in non-fumigated soil divided by the amount of stem growth that occurred in fumigated soil. So the closer we are to a ratio of one here, the more tolerant the rootstock is to this replant disease. And you can see that the peach rootstocks were, were quite sensitive to this replant disease problem, whereas our peach almond hybrids and some of the plum hybrids did much better, less sensitive. This uh, growth assessment was done at the end of the first year, but what we find is that the stunting uh, is manifested onto the period when trees start to yield and it actually cuts into your early yields. So it, it can be a, a relatively good measure of sensitivity to yield loss that may result from replant disease. Okay, so in summary, uh, we found that rootstocks are very valuable tools for management <clears throat> of both Phytophthora crown and root rot and prunus replant disease. When you're planting, it's really important to position your rootstocks so that they can serve as a barrier to Phytophthora infection. Almonds are much more susceptible uh, almond scions are much more susceptible than their rootstocks to Phytophthora. And then we have found valuable levels of genetic resistance, both among commercial rootstocks and among experimental rootstocks to Phytophthora. And uh, we, it is important to note that we found large differences in resistance even among within hybrid types, for example, which we have previously thought to be all relatively sensitive to Phytophthora, we're hoping that we may actually have some that, that stand up well with Phytophthora. 
And then uh, also the fact that uh, PRD tolerance was generally greater in peach almond and plum hybrids compared to peach fruit stocks um, also offers us some potential to work with hybrids that seem to be well liked in the industry presently. All right, uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, if there are any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer them by email. My email address is shown. Thank you. All right, so if we can go now, great, I think we just made it, so this should be working. Yes, Andreas, you're next. Well, thank you very much, Sebastian. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andreas Westphal. I'm extension hematologist at the Kearney Egg Center. And I would like to share some insights that I was able to gather on nematodes in the last few years that I have been working at Kearney. So when we think about nematodes, those are many times for us the unknowns because they live in soil. They're far too small to see them with the naked eye. So. Um, what species do we even expect in an almond orchard? And why do we have to care for them? And what do we have to do to deal with them? So uh, at the current time, no, I do not have this silver bullet of a rootstock available for you, so sorry. Uh, we have to still work on it very hard to get better material out there than we currently have. So I wanted to give you some insight how we develop rootstocks like that. And so on also, unfortunately, I have to be the messenger of the bad information, so we have also some more challenges in future on the horizon that we need to care for. So when we think about the nematodes in the perennial soil environment, we do not have the luxury that we sometimes have in the annual world, that we have a single species giving us all the trouble, and so a single matter would help us to cope with this problem. In the perennial world, we many times have mixes of different nematode species out there. So here you see this cigar-shaped uh, thingy out there is this uh, ring nematode, uh, name giving the annulation on the surface of the nematode. You have dagger nematode out there and root knot and uh, root yield nematode. Well, they all have to be on the slide because all of them frequently occur, occur in the soil environment. And so why is that tricky for us? If we try to find a rootstock that is resistant against all these types, here you see a super infested root and it's where you can see the different life histories these nematodes have, it's gonna be very tricky because unfortunately, uh, resistant against one plant parasitic nematode is not effective against several uh, plant parasitic nematodes. If you look to the very left on that uh, inf super infected root, you see melodogynia or root knot nematode. We're gonna come to a case where we had really great luck in the prunus industry that we had um, protection from genetic resistance against at least the southern root knot nematodes out here. In the center row, you see root lead nematode, which is a nematode that stays migratory throughout its life cycle. So it can stay inside the root, we call it endoparasitic, but it can also live in the soil environment right around the root. So this is a migratory nematode, and as the word says, it continues to meander within the root tissue. So it never really has a single site where it has a very tight interaction with the host plant, so it can feed on cells and continue moving. Why do I emphasize that? Because it's a lot more uh, challenging to find a plant that responds resistant to that, meaning that it doesn't allow it to do this feeding. To the very right, you see ring nematode, which lives in the soil throughout its entire life cycle, and it only feeds from the outside on the root tissue. But why do I put this? Because this is a gradient of how intimate a nematode is associated with the plant. Root knot nematodes become what we call sedentary. They stay at a single spot within the root tissue and are dependent on the plant to bring the nutrients to them. Root lead nematodes meander and they can feed on different cells. Ring nematodes live on the outside, so uh, they can even choose a different host plant should the one that they um, currently are feeding on not be suitable for them. This is reflected in the availability of rootstocks that are resistant to these different um, nematode feeding habits. There are certainly root, uh, not nematode resistant rootstocks out there, but to find them that are highly susceptible against root lead nematode and sustainably susceptible, uh, resistant to that is a much bigger task. And if you think about ring nematode, your choices become even less. Next problem with them is 
that they occur in deep soil layers as shown here. This is just an example of a perennial soil field where you have seen uh, different uh, population densities from the layer from zero to five foot depth in one foot layers where pin nematode, for example, is a, it's the biggest population densities deep in the soil layer. Now, pin is not necessarily our biggest problem in almond production. It occurs in many, many fields, but the concept that nematodes can have very high population densities deep in soil is a very important one because it means when we do our pre-plant treatments and maybe treat these five foot uh, depths of soil, which we try to do, that if we have gaps in our treatments in there, that high population densities can be deep in soil. And frequently when I get reports, oh, well, we checked the upper one and a half foot of soil, there was not a single plant parasitic nematode there, why do we have trouble now? It's very easily explained by this, if there was a perennial there before, likely there can be nematode populations deep in soil. So these are some of the symptoms that we can see. So the trouble with plant parasitic nematodes is they are small, they are away from our regular life of experience that we have in the daily life, they're below ground, so they're difficult to see. So these are some examples of some, call it mild symptoms of root, root knot nematode infection. So you see that to the very right, especially, instead of having fine, nice, blank feeder roots, there's just some, like a string of pearls, one gall from the nematode induction to another on there. So why would we go out and look for this? It's much easier to have field observations done for that. So we saw for, uh, uh, a site uh, graciously uh, for me from Joe Connell brought to my attention where the choice of a rootstock went totally haywire for this particular situation. You see here a crop in the Chico area of almonds grown on Krimsk 86, which of course we know has grown up there quite a bit. Rootstock choice, of course, will have to uh, take into consideration the high wind events up there, but uh, trees were just not performing well. And you see on the right on this picture this really poor looking um, tree that is, well, barely hanging on to life. When we took those out, we should have seen a root system like here. Typical for Crimson 86, a very strong anchoring root system, a very good canopy with it, uh, enough fibrous roots on there, so a well-nourished tree. But in the trouble tree, we had the one like on the right, as you can see here, and at closer inspection, we saw dove egg large galls around, around the root system. So as a nematologist, I can take this into the lab and look in a dissecting microscope and can get the females out of there. So every single gall of these is just loaded with nematode females that feed on the plant. And instead of producing yield uh, for the grower to harvest, instead the nematode uh, lives on the root tissue and does this kind of trouble. Now this is an exception maybe because of course I know that root knot nematode is not that widespread in the Chico area. So it, clearly it's not your first choice or your first deciding factor on what rootstock to use. Wind, of course, is a much more important one up there, but yet if the combination of the rootstock you use and the soil environment you have is not proper, then you run into trouble. So I would repeat the comment made earlier that you really need to examine your field and really know what you're planting your crop into. So the big success story out here is Nemagard. I know now many people shake their head and say Nemagard. I don't grow that anymore. I understand that. But biologically, it's extremely exciting that you have a rootstock that for over 60 years has upheld resistance against three different species of root knot nematode. That's a huge deal, and it's a very important understanding that that has protected and I said prunus industry earlier because, of course, this rootstock is also heavily used or has been used in peach industry. Um, it has really uh, done wonders for those industries that depended on root knot nematode resistance. And 60 years, that's about two farmers generations, so some of you, um, just like myself, have never seen the time before Nemagard, so you may not be aware how much root knot nematode problem we would have without this uh, genetic protection. The challenges for Nemagard is that it's very susceptible to paradulentious baldness, a real nematode. It's very susceptible to ring nematode, and something that we're going to talk at the end of this uh, presentation, also very susceptible to the peach root knot nematode. Now, even nematode, when you see a comparison here of uh, planting into sand or sandy loam after about one year, two years of growth, you see canopy diameters, you see on the left-hand side when the uh, stuff was planted into sand, you see anti for non-treated, fume for fumigated, 
and we planted susceptible rootstock in there. That would be Nemegard and also a resistant one, which was either left non-treated or fumigated. And we did that in sand and sandy loam, and you see in both environments, uh, both genotypes do uh, benefit from a soil fumigation. So what's the big deal about resistance? Well, we have to understand as nematologists, we do need to distinguish between the host plant resistant and tolerance. Resistant refers to the response of reproduction on a different genotype. Can the nematode reproduce? It is susceptible. Can it not? Then it's resistant. And tolerance is maybe at least same as important is the response of the plant to the nematode infection. So there can be plants that allow for nematode reproduction but not get damaged, so those are highly tolerant. Or there can be some that almost do not allow any nematode reproduction at all, but they're extremely sensitive to the infection and they go down uh, very quickly too. This is important to note because of course it will do our overall population density in our field and especially in almonds where we are uh, at least every 25 years replanting an orchard, we need to be vigilant about our soil sampling so that we do not miss an infection, an in, in infestation in our field soil. Now, how can we examine that under field conditions to provide better rootstocks? So luckily, we joined this team that Greg also was referring to, and Dan Klipfer is also part of, where we get uh, from breeders, also from Tom Graziel and Molly Arataya, genetic diversity, which we uh, transport to Kearney, plant into a nematode-infested soil, inoculate every single tree additionally with root leading nematode and root not nematode, and examine trees out there for two years because we have learned early on that a one-year examination is not clear enough. So we are in for the long haul on examining these rootstocks. We do that and then take selected candidates from there and put them into intermediary trial and then have those that are go going further for trials, maybe like Roger Duncan was describing today. So it is a long going process to get uh, rootstocks with better uh, nematode resistance out there. This is an example of one such screen. So the breeders uh, like diversity, of course, and we are the selectors in this. So we get a huge diversity of material from them. And you see also some commercial standards on there, but most of them be being experimental. And you see our first screens give us a huge diversity of responses to that. Clearly something like uh, experimental 20, for example, we can uh, take out of the pool very quickly, but other ones we need to c uh, consider testing them longer because unfortunately nematode abilities to reproduce on a certain genotype can somewhat change over time. So we need to learn about that because of course you want rootstocks that are sustainably resistant and tolerant against root knot nematodes and root lead nematode for that matter. Now, having said that, we are making good progress on that. We have rootstocks that have uh, nematode resistance in them. Um, I alluded to the fact that nematode resistance to one nematode species doesn't necessarily also carry resistance to another one. So we are lucky enough that we find combinations that allows for both resistances. And uh, we are now in the process of horticulture evaluating those further. Now, what I don't like as a comment, what I sometimes see is, I have a zoo of nematodes out there, but I plant first and solve the problem later. That's a big mistake that you can make and shouldn't be making because that uh, is detrimental. To make an orchard recover from nematode damage is extremely difficult. So take advantage of soil sampling and choose uh, your soil treatments and rootstock accordingly. Now, I'm, for the interest of time, I'm just going to go quickly through this because if you think about it, a newly planted tree has a much harder time to reestablish in an orchard than a larger orchard. And yes, if it does never makes it to a real tree like shown on the right, then you have a big issue to even establish your orchard. Now, just very briefly about a peach root knot nematode. This is a species that we found a couple of years ago with the help of Dave Dahl and also um, Mohamed Yakmur, who's here in the audience, I believe. And this is a new species that originally was described in Florida and has now been found in California as well. The challenge with it, we do not know how widespread it is, but the challenge with it is that all the root knot nematode resistance that has protected us for decades, as I described, is in danger because these uh, nematode species can overcome those resistances. And with this, I just would like to quickly wrap up here. So what species to expect? I told you that there's a zoo of nematodes out there many times in our perennial fields. 
uh, that the nematodes are deep in soil, that resistance mechanisms are very different to different species, and that it's a long-going process uh, to find new resistances. So with that, I would like to, to conclude my talk and thank my collaborators in these different uh, environments, and of course, the Almond Board for supporting my work. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Chuck, uh, you go next. All right, so the, um, the title for this panel is Rootstock Selection as a Tool to Address Soil Challenges and Major Pests and Diseases. You about run out of breath before you finish saying it. It's a whole lot of words. But what are we actually after here? Well, planting an orchard is a business decision, and um, it's not like building a factory per se. There's a lot of biological risk out there. And so the, one of the things you're really looking to do is to keep that risk to that biological almond factory um, to an acceptable level. And the rootstock choice is a part of that. Um, from a strictly business uh, standpoint, risk is the potential that a threat will exploit a vulnerability or causing harm. So you're trying to risk, you're trying to uh, manage that risk um, by determining the risk that has the greatest impact and that will help you choose which rootstock can help you um, avoid that risk. As we've already been through a couple times now, a lot of these aspects um, have been talked about before, okay, of course, today. But you really need to focus in on the characteristics that are going to be most appropriate for the site, for the soil, for the weather that can occur there. Appropriate vigor, of course, is really um, appropriate. Vigor is, is pretty important. Roger Duncan once recently said that he thinks that Rootstock selection is the most important uh, variety choice you'll be making, and appropriate vigor is a big part of that because if you under undershoot it, that's going to be not enough rooting. And anchorage has been talked about as well as tolerance to poorly drained so drain soils, nematodes, salt and boron, uh, root rots that Greg talked about. Intermittent flooding didn't come up yet, but in some places that can be a real problem and the replant syndrome. So um, with all the data that's been thrown up there and, and charts and so forth, here's one more chart, but this one kind of boils things down. You've got aspects or characteristics that the almond rootstocks will have and sort of a, a rating. If you've got um, various challenges, or um, characteristics that you're going to need, this is a good way to sort them out and find the one that's going to be most likely to perform for you. Um, in terms of acceptable risk, you have the possibility as that business decision of making, of building this almond factory essentially, the unacceptable risk of having un insufficient vigor or blowover like Kat talked about. And blowover doesn't mean, well, that, that tree is now dead. You send a crew out and they straighten them all up and half of them show up with, um, with root diseases a lot sooner in their life and so forth. So blowover is not just a, a ephemeral event. There's salt toxicity that's been talked about in Phytophthora and oak root fungus. If the unacceptable risk of those is too extreme, that can gear, that can, that can sort of steer the uh, rootstock selection process, as well as poor adaptations to heavy soils. Uh, a number of years ago, we looked at some Nemegard in Yolo County that were on the low end of the field. They were just dying by, by droves out there. And of course, the nematode damage um, that Andreas talked about, you want to know what your um, nematode numbers are. And if your nursery doesn't ask you about if you've done a nematode assessment, then you want to make sure that somebody else reminds you too if you haven't already. The intermittent flooding problem can happen in parts of the state. 
during a drought, you can forget about that. But um, over the course of an orchard's lifetime, uh, intermittent flooding can occur, even if you get four inches of it in October, like Luke talked about this morning. And the replant stunting, if you're not in an area where you're going to have a um, fumigation option because of township caps or other uh, environmental restrictions, and those are going to get more and more restrictive, replant is going to be a, a bigger and bigger thing for, for rootstocks to have to deal with. So that, now you, when you look back at this table, most of these have have developed uh, over the last uh, couple decades. We've experienced sort of a renaissance of rootstocks, and the characteristics that they uh, that they carry can be really, um, really what what leads the whole thing, what, what can steer the whole process. Like Nemegard, like Andreas talked to talked about, was really helpful back in the day when we had runaway um, root knot nematode columns, but it doesn't have as much anchorage and it's not really adapted to clay soils um, or salt or boron. It's the, the least likely performer in replant. And, you know, it's kind of it's kind of ho-hum for yield and, and uh, even um, is, like we said, the lowest or among the lowest for anchorage. The peach almond hybrids, bright hybrid 5 and SG1 are very similar, but there, the, there can be differences in those characteristics too. And when you balance something like vigor with the vigor that you're going to expect from your, um, from your cyan variety, that can, that can make a big difference in your, in your business decision on what rootstock to put in your little, uh, in your little or large almond factory. Uh, a couple of years ago, we saw a place where a grower had an uh, orchard where a grower had put wood colony on um, Hansen rootstock in, a, in, the, in an orchard that was all Nemegard otherwise. And the wood colony trees, if you've ever seen wood colony trees that are kind of kind of a little bit smaller and, and not uh, as big of a canopy by any means, um, they were just as big as all the Nemegard in that, in that orchard. And, and they were actually greener because they were tolerating the alkaline conditions better. And in some cases, you'll see um, the same kinds of things on clay soils where you've got peach almond hybrids that can do it. Another thing to re remember is you can, you can buffer some of these risks with other, other um, practices, such as, as really high berms that can, that can aid the peach almond hybrid to tolerate a little bit heavier soils. So it's all about risk avoidance, and we've got a lot of really good rootstock tools to help us minimize that risk to the point where um, we're going to have a, a, a good successful orchard if we choose the right rootstock. There, even though over the last couple of decades there's been a renaissance of rootstocks and there's so many to choose from, if you've got a, a table and you can choose the characteristics you're looking for, that'll uh, help boil it all down. And um, like, like Andreas was talking about, there are still s some very active programs developing rootstocks that will continue to be more effective tools in a lot of these challenges. Uh, you've got the, the public programs at uh, USDA and at UC Davis. You've got some private programs with the uh, P2G group and the, the Krimsk breeder in Russia. Um, Zager is, is still coming out with some new rootstocks root as far as the uh, Sierra Gold uh, breeding, breeding team coming out with rootstocks that can be um, eventually uh, making a, a, a new renaissance out of the years to come. So rootstock selection, you can optimize the acceptability of the risk that is inherent in planting. Well, thank you to all the speakers. We have time for questions. I'm sure that was a lot of information there, and I'm sure there is a lot of years of research here. So if you have any question, please, please feel free to come here to the mic and ask a question or raise your hand. I'll try to moderate the questions. And just to kick off this uh, section, I had one question for the speakers already. Um, 
in mind. Uh, you know, we have funded research for many years. Uh, these trials, as you could see, takes years, and researchers collect yield data. So I think it also uh, gives them an opportunity to realize uh, the difference between selecting the appropriate rootstock and the perhaps not so appropriate rootstock in terms of yields, in terms of accumulative yield. So um, do you guys have any thoughts or any sense of how many more pounds you get for uh, by selecting the proper rootstock in a, in a challenging condition. Yeah. And I those mean, mics I are working. And yeah? Yep. Hi. Uh, <laughs> were they on the whole time? Um, yeah. So uh, in our trial, in the almond boron rootstock trial, we comparing level, which was our lowest performing, versus most of the peach almond hybrids, it was a difference of 2,000 pounds uh, in the, the highest performing years of like seventh to ninth, seventh to tenth leaf. Um, so that's almost double the yield in those high, oh, per acre, 2,000 pounds per acre. Per acre different. per year. Per year. Okay, uh, so, so in that's 10 years, that's about 20,000 pounds different um, for selecting the proper rootstock. Yeah, stock there's a lot of gosh darn money. And I mean, and I've also acre. seen um, planted on the wrong rootstock was in a boron situation, just pulled out after fourth or fifth leaf because they got so infected with Botrysphaeria. So um, oh. that's an even bigger difference. Okay, know. well, so you are talking from going negative to, to big profitability, yeah. probably. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I see a couple of people here in the line, so um, go ahead. I might even just chime in. Just yes, sure. So we had a, one of our trials we put in back in the mid-90s, we had peach almond hybrids there <clears throat> in a sandy ring nematode infested site. And for the first couple of years, the peach almond hybrid started to out yield everything until they all died. And so, you know, there's, <laughs> again, you, 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 the, the rootstock, you choose your rootstock that, that's going to be your, your biggest protection. And you know, think of it as, I mean, I think of it, per, per, uh, first of all, as a defense before you start looking at the offensive capabilities of it, I guess. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, it's really tempting to just go find our chart and find the one that's on the very top of the graph that has the highest yield and say that's the one I want. But if, it, if something else about the characteristics of that rootstock is gonna bite you in the future uh, a few years down the line, then you know, those yields aren't actually gonna come to fruition for you. So you really need to know the vulnerability of your site and not just look at the yields alone. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it really pays to make the right decision. Yeah. That's what I'm getting. Um, go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, yes. We have a lot of great farmland in the Yuba Sutter area in the river bottom, and it does great. We go ahead and we planted walnuts and paradox simply because there's a lot of oak root fungus. We've been thinking about trying to plant some almonds, but the, the biggest thing is the oak root fungus in the soil. So what would anyone recommend as far as the best rootstock that's resistant to oak root fungus? Oak root fungus, armillaria. Hard question there. You want, you want me to do this? Um, so Mariana 2624 is still kind of the standard that we know is is the most tolerant or is tolerant of. Um, We've tried that; it's not worked very well. Yeah, and and so if if Mariana 2624 is dying, then then I don't know if there are other root stocks that would be better. Um, Krimsk 86 uh, in a, a lab type trial is, was shown to be about as good or maybe. Well, about as the same as Mariana 2624. Um, but other than that, we don't really have data to sh for really most of the other rootstocks. Well, for us, we are planting most of the um, self-pollinating. And in general, for the around that area, not really in the, the river bombs, we've used Viking, which has done very well with independence. But like I said, just the concern is going into more, it's the river bottoms and, and planting there. What do you think about Viking in general? for, for uh, ilk fungus? We don't know. I mean, I, I, my guess is that it's probably not um, uh, <coughs> resistant, okay. but I don't know for sure. Okay, well, in the future, please let us know if you find anything. We are actually, we have research projects uh, that are gonna start looking more and more into our malaria. It's one of the, I, of yeah, it's not like we haven't tried. I mean, there, it's, okay. it's, it's just, you put a bunch of trees in an our malaria spot mm -hmm. and sometimes they die and sometimes they don't. It's, so the research part has been difficult. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. Good question, though. Luke? All righty, and I would say that it, it is a tough thing with the our malaria with, uh, if you're not gonna plant 26, 24, um, 
a crimp skitty six looking like the best thing, but with a self fertile, uh, we're seeing some issues at least with uh, independence on crimp skitty six. So that's and just another. And it's caution. also incompatible with non pareil. Is that correct? Mariana. 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 Yeah. 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 Okay. My question is, I'm intrigued by all the success of these peach Ammon hybrids. Again, from the Sac Valley perspective, where we're most concerned about big wind and wet feet, um, it seemed like. Titan uh, did really well in, in some of the, the data that was presented. And um, SG1, I don't know why the Sierra Gold graph SG1 looks really good at just about everything. So thoughts on um, peach Hammond hybrids for the Sac Valley. Thanks. Yeah, in, in um, the spots where peach almond have been planted, we haven't seen any um, failures in, in heavier ground with good berms that, you know, it's not underwater for several weeks during the year or something like that. Um, it seems to do okay. I'm not saying that it would be a good choice in rice ground, but as some growers, not even to, at the recommended ma recommendation of the nursery, some growers said, hey, I'm going to put some, some heavy horsepower under this orchard and see what happens. Um, it's been doing okay, and it, it's kind of caused a little bit of a shift in the rootstocks that are getting planted in the Sacramento Valley. It's not all about just needing to have um, Crimson Six type uh, heavier ground tolerance. It's it's um, growing them in a way that the peach almond hybrids seem to be tolerating well. I don't know if it has to do with just like phosphites as a as a supplement maybe helping out or or what but they they seem to be taking it pretty well and you know bright hybrid five on its own um d does a really good job too you can you can find different degrees of vigor in the peach almond hybrid and you want to choose one that's going to going to best meet your your expectations yeah, I would agree and just say that, you know, in your rootstock selection, it's important to think about what's going to, what's a make or break characteristic. Like, if you've got nematodes, you need to make your choice based on nematodes. If you've got salts, you need to make a choice based on salts. Because I think Anchorage, there's some uh, management choices you can make to mitigate that risk and still go with a peach almond hybrid if that's what is most compelling to you. So there's, you know, staking. Um, not pruning so heavily so that you get much earlier on a better anchorage system like those two photos showed. Um, maybe managing your water differently so that you encourage a more webby, more robust um, uh, root system. So I wouldn't rule it out in the Sac Valley unless you're in just a real howling, howling, howling wind corridor. Mm -hmm. Is there another question? Yeah. So when you're soil sampling before you plant a vineyard, you know, and you're sampling virgin ground, how often do you find no nematodes when you're sampling, say, annual grasses, and then you install a perennial almond grow, and you have, like, do you ever come into issues where nematodes move in once you plant? Andreas? Oh, yeah. Thank you for that question. I hope I understood correctly. Well, Nematodes can only be there where the gut at some point. Sounds silly, but it's true. I mean, they can move by themselves, so they have to somehow get to the site um, where you find them. So if they don't have a proper host, they will not um, increase in numbers. So grasses, for example, I guess that's what you were referring to, can have a lot of nematodes, plant parasitic nematodes, that won't touch grapes, for example, or almonds, for that matter. So unless they were introduced into the field at some point, they won't be there. Trouble is that a species like root knot nematode can have a very broad host range. Also, nematodes can be passively transported by, well, by flooding a field if soil is moved around. You get around with equipment. Um, of course, in today's day and age, where a lot of stuff is done by custom uh, operations that could be with not meaning to point the finger at anybody, but like a deep ripper, for example, if the equipment was dirty and came out of a field that was heavily infested, that could introduce a nematode infestation. The thing is that 
In most orchards, you will not be able to trace it back to the time of the introduction because it takes years for the nematode to spread and to be noticeable in your situation. But uh, it really depends on the nematode, that nematode species and on its host range. And then just a follow-up. Do you know, so does root knot nematodes also parasitize prairie grasses that you know of? I'm not aware that they, of prairie grasses, I can't think of a report on that at this stage. I do know, though, that many times nematologists have thought, oh, we plant monocot plants which are less susceptible to root knot nematode, but uh, that's not necessarily true. For example, some lines of rye can be excellent host for uh, root knot nematodes. So it's dangerous to make general generalization and assume that something is not a host. Thank you. Sure. I was going to make maybe one more comment, and, and that is that, that sometimes nematodes exist at sort of under-detectable levels, because and they're very spotty, so you can miss them early, and then over time, with an orchard there, they grow. Um, they also need to, they also live, like if an orchard is removed, and I'll give an example of an orchard that was, re was removed two years, for, for gone for two years, and when you first looked at the, you know, just took soil samples that were pretty shallow down to about 18 inches or almost zero, but when we took one foot increments down to five feet, we found a lot of ring nematode that had been hanging out in the bottom like four, three, four, five feet of soil where it stayed moist all year round for three years and there were still a few old roots down there. So, uh, you know, they... If I may add to that, thank you, Rod, a great, great, great observation. That's why I thought it chose, chose this soil profile that many times populations can be deep in soil, which, um, well, is found more than once, I guess. But the other thing to remember is too, especially when we were talking about grapes, grape roots, so Mike McHenry found in previous work, can survive in soil for eight to nine years and be alive after a vineyard has been removed. So the nematode can possibly not continue reproducing on a root like that, but it can maintain itself. So the populations can be there at very low population densities, hang out there, be deep in soil, as Roger just described. You don't find them necessarily in your sample. But because they have such a huge um, reproductive potential, a single female can make several hundred of offspring within one generation, you can have a big or quick increase of nematode numbers. So one thing I was asked just a couple of days ago in a, another session was, oh, how long do you need to grow a crop before you get nematodes? Well, the question is interesting, but it really comes back to the fact that a nematode has to be in your field. In theory, if you do not have a single plant parasitic nematode in your field, and you could keep any traffic that potentially moves nematodes into that field, if you could ensure that, you would never get plant parasitic nematodes. They have to be moved to the site of action, and that happens typically Very passively. Very interesting. Uh, we have more questions. It's great. We have one there and then one here. So let's start there. Okay, so I heard maybe one co more of a comment and then a question, so that uh, when you're in a sandier soil situation, you're actually needing to put boron on and um, rather than having too much of it, in which case I say, come on over to Yolo County and we'll give you some boron. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't, I, uh, we haven't, uh, so if maybe part of the, behind that question was, um, are there rootstocks that are good at hunting down boron? Yeah, yeah, you gotta know what you're dealing with. Yeah, I mean, we have hot spots up and down the west side, but it's certainly not a problem for everyone. Um, and the second question was how, ha in what Greg Brown presented, um, how had they prepared that soil site to maybe um, discourage Phytophthora development by making sure that the soil was not too hard and um, they got good water infiltration. I would, I mean, I feel like it's, 
fairly standard practice to do at least some ripping beforehand. So um, I think they would have done a standard um, ground prep approach um, in those situations. Thank you. And we have a question from here, and then we're going to start wrapping up. Can any of you share um, what are some common mistakes or errors or misconceptions that people have when they're choosing rootstocks? I'm sure you have some good stories or some errors that you see um, people or growers maybe um, making more than once. And if you could share them with us, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, that's a good question. Maybe Chuck, what do they ask you when they go to us? Well, it's not so much what's been asked, but there have been growers that have gone around and just found whatever trees are available because they just got a plant. And that's, that's probably not the best thought out business plan for something that's gonna cost you what it does to establish an orchard. Um, and another one that's somewhat common, I think would, would be for a customer to say to their field rep, hey, I just I need a hybrid route. And there is, there are, they can all be lumped together in one sense as far as the peach almond hybrids between the, the uh, SG1, the, the Bright Hybrid 5, the Hanson, they kind of can be all lumped together into your high vigor, somewhat phytophthorous susceptible or extremely phytophthorous. But there are nuances about them too. Hanson is much more susceptible to, to uh, crown gall and Bright Hybrid 5 will give you a little bit less vigor when you don't need it on some really red hot ground. And those kinds of aspects to it should be, you know, points of discussion. Hmm. So don't ask what you have left and try to be more specific. Yeah, when don't, you be, ask don't be sweeping the corners saying, yeah. what have you got left? Yeah, okay, good. Well, thank you, thank you to all of you. Let's give them an applause for all the work they do. Um, Tomorrow morning, the day kick off at 7.30 a.m. with Continental Breakfast and dedicated trade show time at the exhibit floor. And right now, Thank I you. encourage you to join me to the trade show floor for this afternoon's social reception, sponsored by Alt, Alt, Alt Chem LCC.